<laughs> it's summertime, so I'm totally outing myself. Um, that's me on a research trip a couple years ago, um, which actually has some relevance. Of course it does. <laughs> um, let me just switch to the presenter view. So thank you so much for hosting me. And um, I really love doing these kinds of talks. Um, that's, that's the good news. The bad news is that I really love doing these kinds of talks. And you're probably going to have to get the hook and uh, pull me off the stage because I love, love, love being sort of an evangelical speaker for Southeast Asia. Why you have to have Southeast Asia in your curriculum and it needs to be in the classroom and American students just need to know more and more and more about Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, I'm going to focus my talk today on the, essentially the layers of historical culture, sort of layers of historical culture that have been brought to Southeast Asia over, well, really over 2,000 years. I'm going to be focusing primarily on the last 600 years, but really this two millennium of different layers of culture. And the, sort of the big picture question is, um, how do these outside influences of culture shape Southeast Asia? One of the big debates within Southeast Asian studies is between the role of outside influence and indigenous developments. It's a huge debate in Vietnam, for example. There's a debate, it's about 40 years old. Is Vietnam a little China? Or is Vietnam its own thing that developed with its own indigenous traditions? And the answer is, well, it's, it's sort of both. It's sort of blended, but they, they, they debate these things. And this isn't just an academic question. I think this question has tremendous importance for today's Southeast Asia. Uh, many of the nation states of Southeast Asia, I would say all with maybe one exception, are the creation of colonial interventions. And the political boundaries today are not necessarily the product of organic historical development in Southeast Asia, but really the imposition of political boundaries um, from the, primarily the West uh, during the age of uh, high imperialism. So what I want to look at is these, how these layers of culture have come to make up uh, contemporary states of Southeast Asia. So the big question is, what is Southeast Asia? What is Southeast Asia? Um, is it really a place? Uh, here's a little secret. The, the term Southeast Asia is only about 70 years old. Uh, maybe 75 years old. Uh, it's a new invention. Um, Southeast Asia is sort of the place in between two areas. Um, Indonesia, Indochina, um, sort of references the Indian influence. Uh, the term Indochina really shows that it's in between China and India. And um, the, the significance of Southeast Asia, and for many people, lies in the fact that it's between these two major civilizational economic cores, South Asia and China. It's a porous region in terms of travel because of the straits, and it's a re region of in really incredible geographic diversity. So the various names for, um, and I'll, I'll put the, um, uh, the PowerPoint up on, uh, into Dropbox, so please don't bother trying to write all these down. Um, and I, there'll be a few slides that have a long list of names in there, and I just want you to see the, the sort of linguistic influence on them. There'll be a long list of Thai kings, for example, that shows a very strong Indian influence on them. Um, so the, the names for Southeast Asia. Um, the, most of the names throughout history are trade names, trade-based. Lands below the wind, the Asia of the monsoons, uh, the Spice Islands, sort of vague terms that show that the interest in the area is how to sail there and how to get the key commodity, how to get the spices. Um, the, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, sometimes would use a, a, a couple of terms that really translate as little China, sort of this China-like area to the south of them. Uh, one of the Chinese terms for Vietnam was pacified south. Um, <laughs> And the, in 1942, Lord Mountbatten was given charge of the Southeast Asia Command as part of the, world, uh, the Pacific Theater in World War II. And historians say that's really when Southeast Asia came into being as a term, as a product of um, 
geopolitical thinking in World War II. Prior to that, Southeast Asia isn't, isn't a term in, uh, in common usage. And we can see the, um, the foreign impact on some of the names today. Indonesia is uh, it's really sort of a Greek-derived term. Indonesia, Malaysia, these are uh, linguistically, they have uh, 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 Mediterranean roots to these words. And Indonesia itself references India. So how, how does it come to be that this fourth largest country in the world, population-wise, has the, the largest Muslim population in the world? Why does it have this European tradition name that actually references a different geographical area. Uh, the economic significance of Southeast Asia, um, you've been doing a week of the Indian Ocean, so I'm sure you know it's spices, spices, spices. This is what Columbus was looking for. I've got a great map that I show my students of um, Columbus's plan trajectory, where he thought he was going, and then where he wound up. And he's, he thought he was going to the Spice Islands. And, he believed uh, to his deathbed that he had actually made it to the islands of Southeast Asia and not to the Bahamas, as, as lovely as a place as they are. But the, uh, the spices uh, are one of the key commodities in world history going back 1,500 years, 2,000 years. Tremendously small, tremendously expensive, very easy to transport long distance, but very, very small supply, very, very high demand, and from deep, deep, deep in Southeast Asia. From initially from just a couple of small islands on the opposite side of the Wallace Line. Um, and the, uh, they're the product of Southeast Asia's really sort of fascinating geography, which I'll show you a few maps of in a second, and the, the process of uh, plate tectonics and the separation of land masses to allow this really interesting evolution of plants with these very, very strong natural defenses against predators. So spices make Southeast Asia important. Also access to China, or China's access to the rest of the world, however you want to see that. I think sometimes we need to spend a bit more time looking at the world from southern China rather than looking at southern China. Uh, but this is how you get from here to there, or there to here. You've probably heard about the um, monsoon cycle ad nauseum. Uh, Campbell evidently gave a great talk on, on Monday. Right? And so I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I, I won't give you the, the long version. I torture my students talking about the monsoons back and forth, but they're really important, right? Because prior to the age of industrial maritime transport, you have to sail the winds. You have to sail the winds. And sailing the winds in the Indian Ocean is really easy, provided you're willing to go in the direction the winds are blowing. And if they blow you from the Swahili coast up to South Asia, the Arabian Peninsula, for half the year, then turn and can blow you back down, right? Same thing over here. Half the year, the winds will blow you down towards Southeast Asia from India or from China. Then you wait for the winds to turn and they'll blow you back. Really easy going, as long as you're sailing the winds. Now, that means that you can't leave early. You're trapped right there. Say you sail from China down to Singapore, Malacca. You're gonna be trapped right there. You simply can't just sail down here and move on. You have to wait for the cycle of winds. And it also means that when you get there, people from elsewhere, if say you're a Gujarati merchant and you get down to Malacca, merchants from China are gonna be arriving at the same time because you're all sailing to the south. And very quickly, these merchants discover they can just trade with each other in Malacca or in Singapore or in Batavia and then go home. So rather than doing a long trip of sailing from Gujarat down to uh, uh, the Straits of Malacca, then sailing on to China, buying your goods, sailing back, waiting for the winds to turn again, and sailing back, take almost two years. You can do it, you can leave at the end of the wind cycle, into the monsoon cycle, trade your goods down here, and sail back. So this creates Southeast Asia, and especially the, the Straits of Malacca, as this natural, natural uh, uh, trading hub, uh, sort of a, a naturally determined um, trade emporium. And because the straits are uh, as, um, well, because there's only really one major strait, this channels the world's trade through a very small area. The Straits of Malacca get down to about a mile, two miles across right there, and even smaller in terms of what's navigable. 
the, the central channel. So this is really sort of a, a gullet or a funnel of the world's trade. An important point, which I'll come back to later on, is that the Straits of Malacca is not good land for agriculture. This side of Sumatra is very, very flat and wet. It's not good, not good for wet rice agriculture. The Malay Peninsula has spots of agriculture, but it's nowhere near as productive as Java to the south and um, the, uh, the river basins to the north and what is, what is now Myanmar, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, and Cambodia. Um, the Straits a little further to the south, the Sunda Straits, not so good for trade. Because of the monsoon moon pattern, it, the equator is right about here, right about there, and the monsoon winds sort of break down around the equator. I did some research on this in, <laughs> in, um, in uh, June. I left on a boat from uh, about right here, or about right here in Padang, uh, Padang, Sumatra, went out to the Mentawai Islands. And as you get further south here, the winds break down and are really fluky. It's not the regular monsoon wind pattern that uh, characterizes so much of Southeast Asia. And I was on uh, a converted uh, Bugis Phoenici um, ship, so we had motors. But if we had had to rely on the winds, it would have been terrible going. It would have been really difficult to sail all the way to, um, up to Jakarta because the directions of the winds break down. You don't have that classic pattern of the Indian Ocean monsoon. So what this means for our purposes is that the path, the path of world trade doesn't go along western Sumatra. It goes along eastern Sumatra. And this is where you have, for a couple thousand years, very, very intensive maritime activity. These areas, more or less left alone. You really have to make an effort to get down there. So the islands off of Sumatra, for example, um, not converted to Islam uh, uh, at the same time, the, the conversions along the trade routes elsewhere. And Christian missionaries really didn't even get out there till the 1930s, 1940s. And now there's actually a wave of Islamization of some of these communities out there. You see a growing number of mosques out in these islands. So this area, while seemingly so close to one of the main areas of global trade, is in, in isolation. This is also the best surfing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the Sunda Strait, um, not, not a major path of transportation until the Europeans show up, which is where I will, I will be when the big hook comes out and pulls me off. Okay, so one of my points uh, for today is that outside inf interest leads to colonization, which creates the political framework for contemporary Southeast Asia. Like most of Sub-Saharan Africa, the political boundaries are decided by the process of colonialism. And colonialism really disrupts organic historical development in Southeast Asia as it does in Sub-Saharan Africa. So why is there a boundary between Sumatra and Malaysia? The Straits of Malacca are really narrow, right? These people have a lot in common for thousands of years until the Dutch and British divide up this area, draw a line on the map right here in 1824 and say this is going to be the Dutch sphere of influence, and this is the British sphere of influence. influence. Fast forward, what are we, 109 years, thereabout. Now we have Indonesia and Malaysia, which are two very different nation states. And there's a lot of tension, nationalist tension, between people on either side of this boundary, even though historically, linguistically, culturally, genetically, these people have so much more in common than these people, people from Sumatra and Java. Uh, so these political interventions from colonialism, again, disrupt the organic development of Southeast Asian history. Okay, I went over this, the monsoon wind flow. I don't need to, uh, to hammer that one into the ground. Um, but again, it, geographically, this is where the world's trade is gonna flow, not further south. And also, the further east you go, the winds get more and more dangerous and disruptive. So getting to the Spice Islands gets, can be a little tricky and it's something that is a closely guarded secret for, uh, for about a thousand years. Um, 
either in Southeast Asia or in sort of Southeast Asia, geographically is um, dominated by uh, seas, but the seas are very shallow here, the Java Sea and the South China Sea and um, the, uh, the Straits of Malacca are very shallow, calm waters. When you get to right about here, the seas get much deeper and much more dangerous. So the seas of the eastern Indonesia getting up towards the Philippines, much deeper, much more dangerous sailing there. And this is where the Spice Islands are. So they get, even though geographically they're close, sailing there gets more difficult and more dangerous than sailing in the much smoother uh, going um, Java Sea in the Eastern Seas. Um, the islands of Southeast Asia are part of the greater ring of fire um, that circles the Pacific Ocean. And um, the, on this map you can see under, under the oceans that the Sunda Shelf is a very, very shallow area. That's what these, these lines represent, the shallowness. Once you get across the Wallace Line here, things are much deeper, and you also have um, much more uh, plate tectonic activity, a series of fault lines in eastern Indonesia that break, break things up and create all these smaller islands. It's these smaller islands that have um, the unique evolutionary history of creating spices. Uh, so you don't have some of the, uh, the most precious spices growing anywhere else in the world. They're just a fluke of plate tectonics and evolution that create them here, far, far, far on the fringes of um, uh, the global trade routes. Another fault line map. Um, so maritime Southeast Asia, uh, island Southeast Asia, is dominated by volcanoes. Uh, Mount Cinnabon erupted, uh, been erupting for the past five years. Uh, you probably, some of you remember Mount Pinatubo and the incredible amount of ash that dumped. Um, this is a, a, a list of um, the, uh, three major volcanic eruptions. Kilauea on the Big Island of Hawaii uh, was about 43 megatons. Krakatoa, which is actually a misspelling, it's really Krakatau. The Dutch uh, guy in the telegraph thing was, all, was really excited and misspelled it. <laughs> and the West knows it as Krakatoa, but if you go there, you have to say Krakatau. Uh, and it's a great place, it's, it's right there. I climbed it on my birthday this year in June. Uh, it's really spectacular and it is, is still moving. The island of Krakatoa, Krakatoa today is only about 60 years old. It's about 3,000, 2,000 feet, two to 3,000 feet. And it, it completely blew up in 1883 and uh, came back up out of the water in the 1920s. And so this wow. volcano was completely rebuilt. Really scary for sailing. <laughs> really scary sailing when islands blow up like that. Uh, it's a real hazard for navigation. <laughs> um, and uh, we, we, took, we took the Panisi in there. And um, the, even the, the contemporary navigation equipment was going crazy because there's these huge iron deposits yeah. deep in the water. And it's just, just really a wild place. And I live in Santa Cruz, California. so. Probably a number of my neighbors would tell me it's some sort of spiritual vortex or something, but I just thought it was really neat geographically. Anyway, that's a famous eruption, right? Everybody knows about Krakatoa. <laughs> Nothing compared to Tambora in 1815. Tambora was the big one. There's a fantastic book uh, called Tambora, um, and it's a global history of the impact of the er eruption. And um, his last name is Darcy. I can, I can pass it on in an email. I just finished reading it. He's a literature specialist. It was comparative 19th century literature, but he did an environmental history of the impact of this volcano and took a global perspective. The European story is well known, but he also charted the impact of the volcanic eruption on India and on southern China and on North America. And this huge eruption created a um, uh, created a uh, the win the, the, the a global winter. Uh, 1816 is a year without a summer. It produced um, snow in New England in June and July. Uh, they, uh, they didn't have crop crops. Uh, it produced fantastic sunsets. Maybe you saw the recent film, Mr. Turner, mm. about the, the, yeah. the painter Turner. Uh, he was enthralled with these incredible sunsets in London. Uh, it also led to uh, Mary Shelley writing Frankenstein. 
she and, and Lord Byron and the rest of that crew were off to uh, Switzerland for a summer vacation and it was supposed to be nice and warm and sunny in Switzerland and they had incredible storms because of this volcanic eruption and the cloud from Southeast Asia that had been circling the world. And um, she had a, 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 a series of nightmares during these storms and came up with the idea of Frankenstein. Um, so global impact of Southeast Asia, it's all over. Um, more recently, the, uh, this is a terrible uh, image here, but more recently, that's much better, uh, we know about the impact of these plate tectonics due to the boxing, boxer day, uh, boxing day, boxer day, Boxing Day, Boxing Day, um, earthquake um, just north of Aceh in uh, 2004 that, uh, you know, for many people got them to think about the Indian Ocean as a whole because this really was an Indian Ocean Basin crisis, not just a Southeast Asian, not just a South Asian, not just a East African, but an Indian Ocean wide crisis. Um, again, this makes for dangerous sailing along this area. There's Krakatoa, Tamboros down there, these islands along here, all volcanic on this fault line. Conversely, things are very stable and very smooth along here. So this, this whole section here is just to underline this dramatic difference between the maritime possibilities of the Straits of Malacca and the Java Sea, which are really easy, and then the dangers of sailing to the west of Sumatra and the south of Java. The, the Javanese don't sail south. They have, there's a tradition of the, um, the goddess of the South Sea who uh, will grab sailors and bring them down and grab surfers, they've told me many a time, and, and pull them down into the ocean. You don't wear a certain color of green because that's her favorite color. You don't ever wear that to the beach because she'll pull you down. And there's a lot of fear in traditional Javanese culture about the sea to the south, the ocean to the south. To the north, the Java Sea, smooth, shallow, not a lot of surf, it's like a lake, lots of transportation there. So along the north coast of Java, that's where you'll have uh, the, the first phase of any global impact. The south coast of Java is much more isolated. So to this day, there's scattered Hindu communities on the south coast of Java even though the island is pretty much you know, 99%, 94%, somewhere between there, converted to Islam. You have these little pocket, pre-Islamic pockets due to the geographic isolation there. Um, these, are, again, are more research uh, uh, <laughs> data I collected. This was a snapshot I took just because it was a pretty sunset over a really pretty island in August 2004. Uh, this is off the coast of Sumatra. Here are the trees, short little beach, really good surfing around the corner, beautiful place called Asu. That's what, three, four months before uh, the Boxing Day earthquake. What happened? Same island. What's the difference? All that was underwater. This island was lifted um, two to three meters. Really high. Just imagine what that did to fishing villages along there where before they could just pull their boats out of the trees into the water and fish. Now, they're about half a kilometer in some spots from the water and it's dead dry coral. So some of these islands had, are, have become um, ab abandoned since the earthquake. And I've um, again spent a fair amount of time going along those islands off the coast of Sumatra. And what's going on right now since the 2004 earthquake is essentially, it's like a zipper being pulled. And there's been a series of big and smaller earthquakes that have led to all these islands off of Sumatra getting popped up. And even uh, down further south towards um, Krui and uh, on towards Java, you still see islands that have been raised by uh, local events. And there's been a series of local tsunamis and so forth. So again, this area, this part of the maritime Southeast Asia, west coast of Sumatra, south coast of Java, really, really dangerous. The Wallace Line. Uh, Wallace um, uh, is, uh, essentially co-developed the theory of evolution with Darwin. Darwin had a much better press agent. <laughs> um, Wallace and, and Darwin were, were collaborators, but um, uh, Darwin gets most of the credit. Wallace did his research in Southeast Asia, and you've got two, I think I gave you two excerpts 
uh, from Wallace's um, uh, his notes on uh, Southeast Asia. And I put those in there for uh, two reasons, because on the one hand, he's talking about the, the, the flora and fauna of Java and other parts of Southeast Asia, but he's also observing the people. And Wallace, as a 19th century naturalist, early anthropologist, is remarking on these layers of culture. And in Java, he talks about the old Hindu and Buddhist monuments that he sees in Java um, and the, um, the impact of India on Java, contributing to uh, one of the terms for Southeast Asia, which I didn't mention, which was the Indianized states. The Indianized states, the idea that the Southeast Asian cultures, Southeast Asian states are little Indians. They are Indian culture, Hinduism, Buddhism, transported elsewhere, and then that's what their cultural origins are. Uh, the Wallace line is important because it's the biological line between the, um, the greater Asian landmass and going into the, uh, the Austronesian uh, landmass. And you have a clear divide in species across this line. And again, it's on the far side of this line that you have the uh, development of the really, really precious spices. It also um, aligns with that geographic difference between the calm, <coughs> shallow seas of uh, waters of the Java Sea and the more dangerous seas further, um, further east. Um, others have divided Southeast Asia into um, even, even more uh, distinct bioregions. Uh, the Sudanic, uh, excuse me, Sudaic, Sudanic would be in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, regions of um, Sumatra, Java, the Malay Peninsula, and Borneo versus across the Wallace line where you have different evolutionary patterns versus the Philippines, and in contrast to mainland Southeast Asia. So uh, again, I'll give, uh, give this PowerPoint to you so you can um, possibly use this map to show your students the different, the, uh, well, the biological diversity and how that is linked to the geographic diversity of Southeast Asia. Can I ask a, yeah, please, please. A question on that yeah. slide. So is that a Western point of view, or is this something that has come out of Southeast Asia? Um, that is a good question, um, and because we've talked a lot about this, this yeah, yeah. That I haven't had a lot of. Oh, I'm back to hug me. Bad karma. <laughs> okay, that was yeah, that was a full teacher panic moment. This is the middle of my summer. Uh, relax, my friend. Don't okay. <laughs> Um, so just very quickly by contrast, mainland Southeast Asia is dominated by massive mountains that go all the way up into the Himalayas and rivers that have cut valleys that uh, are fed by the monsoon rain, uh, rains and um, have created this massive uh, river valleys like the Red River, like the Mekong, Chaprai is a little uh, smaller, the Irrawaddy. And this has led to the development of uh, much more stable political institutions based on wet rice agriculture. So the Vietnamese core political entity has been there for 2,000 years. The Cambodian Thai political entity in this area it's gone through different dynasties and a shift from the Khmer to the Thai. But this is a political, agricultural, economic core region. Same thing for Burma, Myanmar. Very stable. In island Southeast Asia, in maritime Southeast Asia, you have a, a pattern of the rise and fall of different powers that dominate the region. Sometimes it's uh, a center, a power base on the island of Sumatra for a couple centuries. That can be replaced by the island of Java as the power center, the hegemon. That can be replaced by Malacca, a city-state that you've, you've got a reading on, a little piece that I wrote about Malacca. That can be replaced by a shift back to Java when the Dutch come in. So the power centers, the hegemonic power center in the islands is much less stable. Whereas in mainland Southeast Asia, you have these much longer lived political economic entities. 
Um, and this is due primarily to the incredibly fertile wet rice agricultural system. Uh, parts of the Khmer Empire at one point produced three rice crops a year. Huge, huge agricultural surplus. But, but even though they're a landed economy, they're still very much connected to the global flow of trade between the Indian Ocean Basin and South China. Java is one area that, it, like uh, mainland Southeast Asia, has a very strong agricultural base. So the island of Java is particularly well suited to rise up as the, the hegemonic power in island Southeast Asia because it's got good access to trade routes. It's right by the, uh, the Straits of Malacca. It's right by the Java Sea, which is smooth sailing. And it's got tremendously, tremendously productive agricultural land for wet rice agriculture. And that's one of the reasons that Java is such a powerhouse. It's also an incredibly populated area. Uh, today, probably at least 75%, maybe it's about 78% of Indonesians live on just the island of Java. It's a huge, huge, huge population base there. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, yeah. um, you said that these rice growing areas are connected to the sea trade routes. Are they also connected to the trade routes into China? They are, but these trade routes going up the rivers aren't that good for trade. It can be done, but they're not, it's not like the rivers of India. It's not like the rivers of China. There are trade routes up there, but they're pretty tough going. Mm -hmm. And the French found this out the hard way. The reason the French colonized this whole area here was not because of any interest in this real estate. They were trying to find a back door to, uh, to China. And they, uh, sent, they, after they colonized this area, they sent guys up the Mekong. Um, half of them died. And by the time they got up into China and they decided it was so, so horrible, they'd rather walk out than go back down the Mekong. And that's why, the, the, then they, as, as they're walking out, the locals said, what are you guys doing up here? And they said, oh, you're at the Mekong. Like, why would you ever do that? Oh, well, you're trying to get back to China. Like, we could have told you that. <laughs> why didn't you go up the Red River? Like, wow, oh, the French took the wrong piece of real estate. So then what happens is the next decade, they invade northern Vietnam mm -hmm. to get the Red River. But then they have to pass by that area. It takes forever. Uh, then finally, 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 they get going up there. and. Um, the demand for silk wasn't there anymore. So they turned to opium production. But this is an entirely different lecture. <laughs> so anyway, the, the, these trading routes aren't as good, they exist. But local trade, very strong. So the Khmer Empire, which I'll talk about in just a second, centered right here, has uh, access to the maritime trade, but also into sort of local mainland um, uh, Southeast Asian trade. Not very strong over, overland trade networks. And it's very difficult to transport goods over land as opposed to putting them on boats. Much, much cheaper. Okay, so land versus sea. Um, a few words on religion and popular beliefs. Uh, there's before 1500, and 1500 is just sort of a marking point. 1500 sort of signals when the Western monotheistic religions really begin to spread in Southeast Asia, both Islam and, uh, and Christianity. Prior to that, you have local indigenous traditions, also called animism, influence from India, and influence from, uh, from China. And animism is really a catch-all term for a huge variety of localized beliefs, sometimes centered around geographic features, sometimes centered around belief in local spirits that might inhabit a tree, or a certain waterfall, or the, the, the goddess of the South Seas but really sort of a localized spiritual practice. And it's incredibly diverse throughout Southeast Asia, but you see some pretty common patterns. In Yogyakarta and Java, you'll see sashes around a big banyan tree. It's a sacred tree. See the same thing up in Hanoi. There'll be local reverence for a tree uh, or for some other, uh, some other animistic site. And um, this is one of my favorite uh, uh, sequences. This is in central, or East Java, and this is Mount Bromo, um, which is uh, one of the most 
sort of active sites for um, uh, making offerings to the gods of the volcanoes. And um, the, uh, there's a, an offering site at the bottom and then an offering site at the very, very top. And um, local Javanese folks would come up, make an offering, and the, the, as soon as you lay it down, the essence is taken uh, and eaten by the gods. So what happens? She makes the offering, and then her, her husband and daughter immediately come up and start picking off the offering table, <laughs> start eating off it. And then this guy, he's a local living, living up there, and folks from Surabaya from the others, and cities nearby would come up and make offerings right here on the edge of the volcano. You know, all this guy's hanging out on the, this gravelly slope, and we fall, fall down there, You're falling right into the earth. He's hanging out the inside, and every now and then someone puts down a piece of chicken or something. He'd, he'd walk up and <laughs> start eating the chicken. And that doesn't bother anybody? No, no, because once it's put down, it's taken. <laughs> I kept waiting for someone to yell at me, oh, that's my offering. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, 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 for one of, one of my big themes, you talk to these, any of these people, ask them, uh, Agama, what's your religion? Agama Islam. They're all Muslims. And this is a great example of the syncretism, the hybridity of religious practice in Southeast Asia, and especially in Java. Clifford Geertz, the great cultural anthropologist, wrote a book called The Religion, Religions of Java, talking about this blending of animism with Hinduism, with Buddhism, with Islam, and the varieties of practice of Islam when you get into both the islands, but also into the mountainous regions of Indonesia, are incredibly, incredibly diverse and really, really blend. Historically, this can par partly be explained uh, in that it was Sufi um, uh, mystics that brought Islam to, uh, to Java and had a much more open blending uh, interpretation of Islam, and that really is sort of the basis for the Javanese practice of Islam. Right now, there's a political movement designed to get rid of these non-Islamic practices and to bring Javanese Islam, Indonesian Islam, much more in accordance with Sunni Gulf state interpretations of how one practices Islam. Um, there's also a tremendous Hindu, um, Hindu influence. These are shots, I think these are all of Bali. Uh, and that's, that's Java. All, almost all of what is now Indonesia, um, sort of west of Lombok, had a very strong Hindu influence and were Hindu kingdoms. Mainland Southeast Asia up to Vietnam were all Hindu kingdoms. And then there's a conversion to Buddhism, and then there's a conversion to Islam. But that Hindu basis is still there, and still there in a very, very strong way. The Thai king today, for example, um, I think he's Rama, is he Rama the ninth? I forget which, which numbering he is, but the, this line of kings are all Ramas. Who's, who's Rama, who's Ram, who's Lord Ram? The hero of the Ramayana. The, 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 the Ramayana, Ramayana. The, Ramayana. The, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, the two great Hindu epics. This is, this is the, the name that the Thai king, a Buddhist king, takes. And if um, the, uh, the king is always, uh, the iconography of the Thai king, he's always on top of an eagle, a Garuda, which is also from the, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. So even though um, they're Buddhist, the, this imagery is still there. The Indonesian National Airlines is Garuda, referencing Garuda, right? Um, and in some ways, in some places, it's sort of like a, the, the legacy of Greco-Roman mythological traditions. You know, um, I, one of the first times I was in Indonesia, I had a young friend, a um, uh, Muslim guy from uh, Padang, Sumatra, big tattoo of Ram on his arm, or oh, Arjuna, Arjuna. Arjuna on his arm from the uh, Mahabharata. And I said, well, how do you, how do you feel about that? that as, a, as a Muslim with a tattoo of a Hindu figure, he's like, oh, it's, it's just, it's a good story. And I realized, it, 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 I realized it's sort of like a Christian wrestler from Oklahoma with a tattoo of Hercules. 
It's, it's a story. It's a story. But it's, it's a cultural foundation there. And so even in areas that are, you know, you, you look at a, a map showing religions of the Southeast Asia and say, well, that's an Islamic area, there's a lot of Hindu, Buddhist, and animist traditions still very much alive. And that's one of the things that I think you can see captured in that Wallace piece where he's talking about Java. Because he, he's looking at these, um, these older pre-Islamic archaeological sites. Uh, Buddhism, uh, two strands of Buddhism in Southeast Asia. Uh, Theravada strand comes from southern India and is really the dominant strand. Vietnam is Mahayana, which is uh, uh, a strand of Buddhism that comes down through China. Slightly di uh, different in terms of theological practices, but very different in terms of um, the tradition of the bodhisattvas and rules around monasteries and so forth. And what this represents, the, the, the Vietnam is in the, the Mahayana tradition and the rest of Southeast Asia has this sort of Theravada uh, connection, is that divide between the Indian influence and the Chinese influence on Southeast Asia. Um, and in many ways, the, the cultural line between Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia and Thailand is really the cultural line between the greater Sinitic and the greater Indic world. Now, many Southeast Asianists go nuts when I say things like that <laughs> because it, it seems that you're sort of denying the agency of the locals on the ground. Not my intention at all. But the Chinese influence is very, very strong versus the Indian, uh, the Indian influence elsewhere. Um, and then the Chinese influence, Vietnam, but also urban Southeast Asia. So Malacca, Singapore, what was Batavia, what's now Jakarta, uh, Surabaya, Semarang. I think I give you a piece on Semarang about the, um, the Dutch colonial building there. Very, very strong Chinese cultural influence in the urban centers of Southeast Asia. The Thai royal family has a lot of Chinese DNA in, that, in their bloodlines. They've got Indian names for the family and then uh, Chinese connections. Again, Southeast Asia has these layers and layers of outside influence. And what is Southeast Asia today is the, it's this combination of different layers coming in from the outside, blending with indigenous tradition and manifesting uh, the combinations, the hybridity of these layers in different ways in different parts of Southeast Asia. But most parts yeah. of Southeast Asia were a part of the Chinese tribute system at some point in time, right? Um, in various ways. It's str stronger in some areas than others. Malacca, very much so. Java, much less so. Parts of the Philippines, very much so. Southern Philippines, what uh, we call today the Moro Act. <coughs> very much connected to the tribute system. The northern Philippines, much less so. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's spotty. And, it's, and in many ways, it's uh, sort of strategic. Uh, the, the, the Chinese tribute system um, was much more interested in connections with the Straits of Malacca mm -hmm. than more far-flung areas, which um, really wouldn't uh, lead to uh, immediate benefit. Mainland Southeast Asia, much, much, much more closely tied. Vietnam, the Khmer Empire, uh, the various Thai uh, kingdoms, very much tied to the tribute system. Yeah. Okay. Um, then after 1500, Western monotheism, both Islam and Christianity. And interestingly enough, they develop in a symbiotic slash antagonistic relationship. Islam comes with the trade routes. It's uh, the, the, the maps that show the historic spread of Islam are strongest through the Straits of Malacca, north coast of Java, onto the Spice Islands. And then steadily conversion moves out off the main trade areas. The, um, when the Europeans come in, they bring with them the crusading mentality. And um, one of my favorite little stories is when the, um, when the Portuguese take Malacca, what, what term do they use to refer to the local Muslim population? Moros. What's a Moro? Moro is the term Iberians use for the North Africans. The, it's, it's the root of, of the root word of Morocco, right? They use the same terminology for the people on the opposite side of the world and bring with them the same crusading mentality. 
the same sense of hostility, the same idea of a war of Christianity against Islam, militarily, theologically, but also economically. And um, I'll get a little bit ahead of myself. I know I need to speed up on this. Um, the Cham State, we'll go real quickly through Champa. But Vietnam was not always, Vietnam as we know and love it today was not always Vietnam. For about half of Vietnamese history, it was just the North. And the South here, very, very Indianized. Look at the Cham ruins. Um, and they look like they uh, are from somewhere in, in South Asia. Uh, initially Hindu and then Islamic and ethnically Malay, ethnically linked to Java, to Sumatra, to the Malay Peninsula. Uh, they were a plunder-based economy and they were conquered and ethnically cleansed mm -hmm. by the Vietnamese state uh, between the 1400s and the 1800s as the Vietnamese state pushed south. And there's still a few Chom communities in Vietnam today, but they're very, very small. Most of the Choms were pushed inland over the mountains and into the Mekong area. So if you go to Cambodia, you'll see Chom villages. Uh, this is a mosque at a Chom village, and I love this because it shows the incredible range of the Mekong. This is at low water. These are floating, uh, floating uh, buildings, houses on stilts, and then here's the mosque. Where's the high water mark at the mosque? Mm -hmm. It covers up the bottom uh, landing of the stairs. So that's the flood range. Mm -hmm. So even though we're well, well, well inland in mainland Southeast Asia, we're connected to the maritime world. This is a big river that connects uh, Cambodian uh, markets to other Southeast Asian uh, markets. So I would argue that even, even deep, deep, deep in mainland Southeast Asia, we're in the outer fringes of the Indian Ocean world. Because you can get in a boat and get, there and get to India or East Africa. Uh, okay, the Khmer Empire. This is the core of um, uh, the, uh, the Cambodian uh, civilizational core. Very, very much influenced by Indian traditions. Devaraja is the god-king system, the belief that the god, the king is a manifestation of Shiva or Vishnu. Uh, the, uh, the court names of the Chams and the Khmers show a very strong South Asian linguistic connection. The um, Khmer Empire built a massive, massive uh, state with a massive bureaucracy, um, incredibly wealthy due to the flooding of the, uh, the Tonle Sap, uh, which is, um, they call it a lake, but it's really sort of a bladder. Because what happens is this is the water in low season and this is the water in high season. So much water comes down the Mekong and gets dropped locally that some years the lake swells five times in size. So much water comes down that here's the Mekong and here's the Tonle Sap uh, uh, River. This flows south in the dry season. In the wet season, the river reverses course and flows in here. So the Mekong feeds this, and then it drains out. What that means is, well, you put your mosque very high up, <laughs> make sure your house can float. Um, but also, when the waters recede, that land, very fertile. Pre-irrigated, pre-fertilized. Fantastic for wet rice. Um, and the trick is taming the waters. This is a reservoir um, in Angkor Thom, the old Khmer city. Um, that uh, it's about a reservoir is about 800 years old. Here's a, uh, another reservoir. They built these massive reservoirs so that in the dry season, which is really dry, really hot, really dusty, they could continue to grow rice. That's how they're able to grow three rice crops a year. Um, these are some engravings from uh, the Angkor, uh, Angkor sites. Here's the gigantic catfish. You ever watch River Monsters? Any river monster show on Southeast Asia is worth watching. <laughs> the, the things that come out of the Mekong are absolutely amazing. Like 20 foot stingrays in fresh water um, and catfish, like two, three meter long catfish. It's, this catfish is like eating a deer or a small dog. <laughs> um, this is the, this is the Tommy Sap at low water. So now it's, it's flowing from north to south. I, I've been to Cambodia almost a dozen times, and for whatever reason, I was always there when the 
river was flowing toward the south. And then the last time I was there, the river was flowing the other way. And it was such a strange thing to see a river reverse course. It's like going to the Mississippi and, and it's flowing the wrong way. It was just so, so odd. Oh, and by the way, my film on Colonial Phnom Penh is 29 minutes. It's on YouTube and Vimeo, Vimeo perfect for classroom use. <laughs> A little plug up for Yeah, they're all in the Dropbox to connect the buildings to them. Yeah. So this, this, these are all examples of the, uh, the floating life in, in Cambodia. Is the archaeological sites of the Khmer Empire heavily, heavily, heavily Indian influenced? These are Hindu temples. These are the other main, uh, that's Angkor Wat. Um, this is the interior of Angkor Wat. And Angkor Wat is spectacular simply as a structure. It's also spectacular because it's about three kilometers of carvings that are a thousand years old, about, that depict scenes from the Mahabharata, as well as local political events. So definitely part of the greater Indian Ocean world, way up in mainland Southeast Asia. Um, and then with the transition to Buddhism, uh, you have the construction of the Bayon which um, also shows very, very, very strong Indian, Buddhist Indian uh, tradition. This is the Bayon, and this is a monument to um, uh, Jayavarman the seventh. Again, the names, the names, Varma, it's a South Asian uh, royal term, the, the Arman, uh, linguistically, um, on, on the end of the name there, great battle sites. I'll go on at length about these uh, these various engravings. But one thing I want to call attention to is the way that these 800-year-old uh, engravings show ethnic difference. These are Khmers, Cambodians. These are Choms. And then um, these guys are Chinese, mercenaries and merchants. And uh, the Khmer Empire is very much connected to the greater Chinese trade world. Um, Very, very quickly, with the fall of the Khmers, there's a shift towards what's now, uh, what's now Thailand, and Ayutthaya is one of the first kingdoms. And they're also very, very much in this Indic pattern of uh, royal pageantry, religion, and uh, linguistic connections. So the, uh, the prevalence of Rama as a royal name, signifying um, uh, Lord Ram from the uh, Ramayana. This is Ayutthaya, this is just north of Bangkok. Um, also uh, a great example of the blending of wet rice agriculture and trade. This Thai kingdom was a, and its capital was a major, major trade center. <coughs> it's a big Buddha. Okay, um, for uh, island Southeast Asia, the main point of interest here is again the Straits of Malacca. Because whoever controls the Straits of Malacca controls the flow of trade in and out of um, the, uh, the, uh, the greater Chinese sort of economic uh, world. And Srivijaya uh, is one of the first ki island-based kingdoms to control this trade, a thalassocracy, uh, an ocean-based uh, empire. Unknown to the historical record, prior to about 1900. A literate society that wrote on palm leaves. They, they disappear. We don't have records from Srivijaya. Um, a, a area that had monumental stone architecture up here in the mountains, but most of the monumental architecture down here was built of wood. So we don't have the Angkor Wats or the Bayons or the Borobudurs to look at. And so it was sort of lost from the historical record. And it was Orientalist scholars working in Indian and Chinese sources that <laughs> triangulated the existence of the Southeast Asian kingdom. So somewhat like Crete, uh, which was more or less unknown to the Western historical record until archeological work around 1900. This is a, a newly discovered area. Unclear where the capital was, unclear exact what the exact borders were, but we do know from Indian and Chinese sources, major, major economic center. They controlled the flow of trade. 
suppressed piracy and provided port facilities. Those are the two things you need to do to control uh, the Straits of Malacca. <clears throat> Java, we have better historical evidence um, and uh, better archaeological evidence, especially for Central and East Java. Um, lots of building in stone. But one thing about Srivijaya is that they did not have the agricultural base. These are not great wet rice growing lands. So Srivijaya had to import its food. When Java starts to dominate the Straits of Malacca, they can grow their own food. So they solve that economic problem. Um, Borobudur is one of the, the great uh, wonders of the world. Absolutely incredible site. World's largest Buddhist stupa. Um, it tells, the, the monument tells the, uh, um, well, Buddhist theology. You, you enter it as a mandala and you circumnavigate clockwise. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the bottom three levels are the material world, the world of sin, the world we're all trapped in, the, the cycles of reincarnation, right? Um, and also great depictions of what daily life is like in Java in the year of 7, 776, the year 800. Um, and then the next three levels tell the lives of the Buddha, uh, of Buddha's path towards enlightenment. And then the upper levels represent Buddha's enlightenment. Incredible, incredible sight. Um, and was uh, in use for about a century and then abandoned due to a dynastic shift and abandoned and covered up in volcanic ash for about a thousand years. Now, locals in that part of Java knew that there was something there and it was an odd ge geological formation and knew it was special, but it wasn't, uh, wasn't dug up until um, Raffles, uh, Thomas Raffles, uh, or Stanford Raffles, was in charge of um, Java in the early 1800s. And I was always suspicious of that because Historians, French historians, will tell you that the French discovered Angkor Wat. But locals knew it was there. It was, it was a pilgrimage site for Thais. Everybody knew it was there. Some of the outlying buildings, yeah, they were covered up by jungle, but the, the big things they knew were there. I was always suspicious about Robador, and maybe that was sort of a myth. And I did my, uh, a year at a uh, university just down the road from Robador, and I talked to a number of Javanese archaeologists, and they said, yeah, it was, it was covered up and it was Raffles, it was the, the colonial uh, archaeologist who discovered it. Um, but it was covered up um, by volcanic ash as things shift to the other side of um, uh, that part of Java, and a Hindu monument was built. A sort of a forget about the Buddhist thing, we're doing the Hindu thing over here. Again, showing Indian influences here in the, in the center of Java. And this is around Jogjakarta, right in the heart of, geographic heart of Java. Um, Majapahit is one of the Javanese dynasties that will rise up. Um, but the really significant, um, the real significance of, of Majapahit is that here we have the full blossoming of that Javanese fusion of the agricultural base, tremendously fertile land, with control of the seeds, control of the Straits of Malacca, but also control over the Spice Islands. Now, some Indonesian nationalists will point to Majapahit as a justification for today's uh, international boundaries for the Indonesian nation state. And some extremists will say, well, Malaysia should be in there too. Um, this, this is not the, the, the exact boundary of the Majapahit state. The Majapahit state really was Java with these areas as dependencies that would swear allegiance to them. So it's not exactly that this whole maritime area was conquered and brought under there. That they would be, uh, the ports would swear allegiance to the, uh, the, Javanese, uh, the Javanese core. But this really is Java's uh, golden age and much of the expansion was at the expense of Srivijaya, the uh, Sumatran-based uh, uh, um, uh, thalassocracy that came before. Um, this map shows the spread of Islam in Southeast Asia. And again, it, it lands first along the trade routes. 
and then spreads off the trade routes much, much later. So these islands aren't even factored in there because the Western monotheism, be it Christianity, be it Islam, doesn't come to this area until the, um, the mid 20th century. Okay, so Malacca, and I know I've got to start wrapping up here. Insignificant before 1400. And you've got the piece I wrote on Malacca, which gives you, uh, gives you this history. Um, insignificant um, until uh, a Malay um, prince sets up a port facility there and strikes an alliance with the Chinese. And the Chinese influence in the rise of Malacca is incredibly important. Having China as a protector and getting uh, tribute state status, which is like most favored nation status, is a huge economic boost for Malacca. Because Malacca provides port facilities, it provides a legal system, it provides a multi-ethnic, multilingual system of harbor masters, so people could operate in languages that were familiar to them, that they were comfortable with. But Malacca has the backing of the big Chinese empire to the north. And Malacca rises at this important moment of Ming China's projection of power with Zheng He and the, um, and the fleet. This, is, this picture should be in everyone's PowerPoint for your class. All my students love this. Yeah. Columbus's ship next to one of Zheng He's ship. Just absolutely, absolutely amazing. Um, and then, you know, just imagine if the Gama had come into the Indian Ocean when Zheng He was floating around and how different history would be. How would it, yeah. We had one of our scholars, was it Campbell or was it Don, who questioned, who, who, who threw the actual the size in question, you know, was it really that extreme? Or? There, the, the latest that I've seen is that there were a few that were 400 feet. A few. Maybe as many as seven. Um, but a lot of 200 footers. Mm -hmm. And these are uh, built in the junk tradition of really sort of rectangular ships, not uh, uh, thinner ships designed to go uh, upwind, uh, to, to tack against mm -hmm. the wind. These are just for going downwind, and you can have a much, much wider boat. So the carrying capacity of these ships is, is just enormous, just absolutely enormous. Now, they could, they could only go downwind. And so their, their range is restricted by the, um, the monsoon wind flow. But um, yeah, this, the, the Ming court burned all the records of Zheng He's fleet when they shut down the fleet in the 1430s. And it's just a huge devastation to, it's devastating for historians. Because how do you, you can't do this history because it's, uh, they tried to silence this history because the, well, for a variety of reasons, but. On the Indian Ocean website, there yeah. is um, a picture of a stern rudder that was found near where these ships, the shipyard where these were built, mm -hmm. and apparently you could put 30 men side by side on mm -hmm. the stern rudder, so it was yeah. big. Yeah, and yeah. Then, the, the, um, the archaeology yeah. in, in uh, Ran Nanjing, I think, yeah. in that quarter, yeah, is just absolutely right. exactly. amazing. Exactly. It's huge, huge. And midnight. then there's also on the site a description, which you would find in Ibn Batuta, um, he, of him describing the ships and the commodious, uh, you know, I think Rostan read that actually on, on Monday, mm -hmm. um, about how they actually grew food on, you know, food, avoiding skirt, water, the, uh, yeah. ability to project power with about 20,000 human beings mm -hmm. in the fleet, 20,000. They carry big animals on, on Big the animals, giraffe. water, giraffe. lots of water. Giraffe. Giraffe. Absolutely giraffe. amazing. Giraffe. But, but don't, don't go too far down this path and, and steer clear of the Gavin McKenzie's nonsense. Uh, he, you know, the, uh, because these ships are, are good. They're, they're, Zheng He's not an explorer. Zheng He is sailing the known world. And these ships are only good for going downwind. They can't, I, I, the, the idea that they, that they went around Africa and into the Mediterranean, uh, I mean, that, that book's just absolutely insane. And there's a great website by um, some Australian and Singaporean historians that just systematically tear apart Gavin McKenzie's uh, uh, two books. So, I'd love to have yeah, I'll, I'll, I've, got, I've got it somewhere. There's also a, a, a good uh, uh, PBS special on Gavin McKenzie's where he, he, they, give, they let him give his argument and then 
take it apart. Yeah, it's an incredible history. It's really fantastic. It doesn't need to be over exaggerated. Okay, but for our purposes, Zheng He is incredibly important for setting up Parameshwara. And Zheng He is a figure throughout Southeast Asia. Um, here's a statue of him in Malacca. If you go to Semarang, there's a great um, uh, Chinese uh, temple devoted to him and statues of him. Semarang is on the north coast of Java. Uh, so that Chinese influence is very strong in the urban centers of Java. Uh, Malacca, again, multi-ethnic trading port. Um, and here is um, uh, Moroccan currency using Arabic calligraphy. And then this, this is some of my absolute favorite, and I think the pictures of this are in the article. This is, Chi these are Chinese products for export with Islamic calligraphy. And then this, this is just so beautiful. This traditional Chinese style of calligraphy with, with uh, um, Arabic characters, or Arabic letters, which is absolutely amazing. This is for export to the Indian Ocean world. Just, just as, if, as you walk into Walmart today, where is everything made? China. You walk into the Walmart of Malacca in 1400, where is everything made? China. China. Economic you know, center. Do you know what it says in Arabic? Can anybody read it? Mm -hmm. um, um, I see. I'm only the near and I have a little bit of the issue. Like, where is the work or um, do good as if you're going to live forever? That's not and there's a the second part of that, but it's not there. Allah. And and do for your uh, hereafter as if you die tomorrow. Right? Yeah. And but but it's 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 from the Quran, correct? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's Quran verses. Yeah. And that second one is Allah. Yeah. It's not the Quran. It's the Hadith. It's a Hadith. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, more. I mean, this is you know, China. Pottery from South China. Uh, designed for export to the yeah. greater Islamic world, to the Indian Ocean world. Um, this is the wooden palace. Um, note that this, this is not heavily fortified. This is a fairly open city. It's a port center. There's a naval, there's a naval presence there in order to secure the peace, but it's not an armed fortress. That will all change when the Portuguese show up, <laughs> which they will, and oh, that's here's here's the here's the mosque in, in Malacca, right by the Jinho Museum, showing a fusion of all sorts of different architectural influences. Um, going to fast forward here. So when things change, when the Portuguese show up, um, you know one of my favorite lines from history is Vasco da Gama when he gets to India. What do you want? Christians and spices. Long, awkward silence. <laughs> and evidently, da Gama's, some of da Gama's men went into a Hindu temple and looked at some Hindu art and, and were convinced for a couple of weeks that somehow it was a depiction of the Virgin Mary. That they kind of got things wrong, but they eventually gave that one up. They were looking for a Christian ally against the Islamic world. And that Portuguese penetration of the Indian Ocean world and into Southeast Asia has to be understood as a sort of the last act of the Crusades. Because mm -hmm. when Bagama when comes back, he comes back with more ships and uses violence. Because what did he find on his first trip? They didn't have much to sell the world of the Indian Ocean. <laughs> so violence on the Swahili coast, violence on the Malabar coast, and then, uh, <laughs> who's, that, who's that Portuguese explorer, right? <laughs> um, and uh, it's not the government of Albuquerque that develops the state of India strategy, which is a recognition that they can't conquer huge amounts of land, but they're going to seize key waterways and key ports. And one of the most important would be Malacca. And Albuquerque says, whoever, whoever um, controls Malacca will control the flow of the spices of the world. And he, he writes back to the Portuguese king and says that if we take Malacca, we will hold a knife to the throat of Mecca, his words not mine, and make the Venetians come to Lisbon to buy spices. Because the Venetians are trading with the Islamic world, right? 
Arab, uh, the, the good crusading Iberians just hate that. And they're paying the, the big markup on spices to the Venetians. So his thinking is global. It is, it is economic warfare tied into this last great act of the Crusades. And um, arguably, his attack on Malacca is a crusading effort. Um, here's a depiction of the attack from the Malacca Museum. Here's uh, archaeological remnants from the Portuguese period. The Malacca Museum places a lot of influence, uh, um, emphasis on the, uh, the violence of the Portuguese rule. Uh, here's a statue of Albuquerque inside one of the museums. There's no good. <laughs> <laughs> Much to the delight of my <laughs> the Malay tourists who were observing me. Um, and um, when, when Portugal takes Malacca, it draws this part of the world into really a, a much tighter Indian Ocean uh, network and connects places like Timor to East Africa much more closely. Um, for, uh, for a number of reasons, because in, in these Portuguese colonies, you have a lot of people moving around. So people from Brazil, people from Mozambique, people from Timor, people from Malacca, people from Portuguese colony in, um, in China, Macau, are moving around. And this part of Southeast Asia uh, is very important for producing sandalwood, which is heavy demand in China for incense, and also in European cathedrals, for instance, but also producing slaves for the wider Portuguese empire. And slaves from Africa are brought to Timor. So Timor, which is deep, deep, deep into Southeast Asia, sees this incredible mixing of people there. And that's, again, one of the things Wallace observes. And I will wrap up in just a second. Here's some images of Timor. Um, St. Francis Xavier, the great uh, 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 missionary visited Portuguese Malacca and swore he would never go back there because it was such a den of sin and iniquity that the, uh, <laughs> this outpost of the Portuguese Empire, while claiming to represent Christianity in his eyes, yeah. swore he would never go back to, the port uh, to that outpost of the Portuguese Empire, even though that's, that's who's sponsoring him, right? Um, and uh, Portuguese Malacca, again, as this crusading mentality, as this Crusading outpost finds itself in almost nonstop warfare with two of the more powerful sultanates nearby, Johor and Aceh. And um, sometimes they strike alliances with them. More often than not, they're at war with one of them, if not both of them, for the um, 130 years of, uh, of Portuguese rule. Constantly, constantly at, at odds with them. And I, you know, playing the blame game. I think that the Portuguese importation of the crusading attitude and the Portuguese willingness to use violence where they could not have, uh, where they could not compete economically, created that, that century of hostility there. Now, some historians have noted that Islam uh, begins to make more converts in this time period as an ideology of resistance mm -hmm. to the crusading outsiders. Um, so it's almost like uh, Frankenstein with the, the crusading mentality reinforcing its own, uh, its own enemy. Uh, in contrast uh, to Parameshwara's Malacca, Portuguese Malacca is fortified. They're afraid, here's, uh, here's some of the ruins, um, guns. Yeah, almost always at, uh, at war. Is it a crusade? Is it a jihad? Is it, is it simply the extension of several centuries of um, uh, Mediterranean warfare into the Indian Ocean world? Also, when the, the Spanish get to uh, the southern Philippines, what do they call the Muslim populations they meet there? Moros. To this day, the southern Philippines is called the Moro Land. Completely imported the Mediterranean um, uh, uh, view. Okay. Now, when the Dutch step in, the Dutch lead to a couple of changes. The Portuguese impact in Southeast Asia is crusading and it's feudal. 
Da Gama, Albuquerque, the rest of them, <coughs> conquered areas, went back to the Portuguese king, and expected to receive titles and, and larger estates. That's feudalism, right? They also went out and killed in the name of Jesus because that's what he would have wanted. <laughs> Different interpretation of the book than, than the one I got, but who am I to judge? Um, the, Dutch, the Dutch are very different. The Dutch, you have the advent of modern capitalism. The Dutch are not Catholic. They are Calvinist. Predestination. You're either saved or you're not. Missionary activity, really not much point in that. So they don't, they don't, they don't provoke the same ire in the same way. And they're, um, they're focused on um, uh, a much more modern uh, form of economic exchange, and at least the development of the first modern publicly traded corporation, the Dutch East India Company. Uh, this is the, one of the first stocks from the Dutch East India Company, that you invest in the company, and it's going to be a long-term enterprise. It's not feudalism. It's not uh, old... The, the, the ancient form of investing in a voyage or in a caravan for trade. You invest in the, in the company with the idea that the company will be there indefinitely. Uh, they shift the center of power to, uh, to Java, uh, what they call Batavia, which is now Jakarta. Um, and Malacca goes into decline. But they leave some presence there. Here's, a, here's Dutch buildings in, um, in Malacca. The Dutch fortifications in Malacca. Um, VOC symbol, the Dutch East India symbol on the cannon. There's a windmill. You know it's Dutch. They wore those outfits. <laughs> How miserable were they, right? Um, guess where that came from? China. 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 Who's in charge now, the Dutch? OK. What do you want? Okay. <laughs> Not a problem. We got it. And they want both That's capitalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it, and and, and it, the more things change, the more they stay the same, right? Um, and uh, here, I think it's almost my last slide. I want, in, in terms of, uh, just to finish up, in terms of the Indian Ocean and the larger patterns of trade, you've seen the map a zillion times at this point of. Uh, Swahili coast connection to uh, Persian Gulf and India. Sail this way with the monsoons and sail back, right? Then you can sail down here with the monsoons and sail back. You can sail up here with the monsoons and sail back. Uh, the Portuguese followed that pattern. They, they stuck to the Swahili coast. The Estado de in India um, program was to seize key ports and waterways, and they sort of clung to the periphery. The Dutch pioneered a different route to Southeast Asia, going far, far, far to the south, and then swinging in here through the Sunda Straits. You keep going, you keep going south and east and east. Don't go too far, because you'll wind up in Australia and die. <laughs> I just read a fantastic book on vacation called Batavia's Graveyard about a shipwreck of a, a VOC ship here in the early 1600s, absolutely amazing, yeah. absolutely amazing. And then amazing. there's Dirk, what his name is, uh, plate that was left yeah. on the beach there. Mm -hmm. It's also on the Indian Ocean yeah. website. Yeah. They found it nailed to a piece of driftwood, yeah. you know, and it's in the Rijksmuseum Museum now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really dangerous, but much, much faster. Mm -hmm. And closer to the Spice Islands. Mm -hmm. And so they develop a much more efficient way of connecting Southeast Asia to the European economy. The Portuguese actually didn't make that much money off the spice trade. They made some, but it was, they, they made more money taking goods, spices, and sandalwood to China. They made their real money through um, interregional or, or in, intra Asian trade rather than trade with. Um, with uh, Back, uh, back Just because it was so expensive to get back there. Yeah, and then <laughs> what's the economic center of the world? You know, the, when the Portuguese get to the Indian Ocean, they don't have much to offer, so they start shooting, right? <laughs> so even Portuguese merchants who are bringing stuff back, they still don't have much to bring back. Right. There's not much to trade. You're simply right. delivering it. Um, the uh, the trade with China, on the other hand. 
China has has money. China can Stop. China can pay it down. Yeah. So, I'm sorry I got I got a little off tracks with the uh, off track with the. We um, still have the afternoon. Okay. Um, we'll be happy to continue our discussion. Yeah, and I and I, 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 I didn't even touch on Singapore, but it's there. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and the uh, the readings I gave you um, were a couple of snapshots of different aspects of this history. What I want to do with the talk was give sort of the overall framework, and so you can insert those readings into that, uh, into that discussion. So, thank you. Thank you.